presented the 1959 Nobel Peace Prize. The issue of nuclear disarmament has punctuated the history of the Nobel Peace Prize for more than 60 years. The cry demanding a world free from nuclear weapons has rallied people together for generations, but today, as the nuclear threat has reached new heights, we are at a threshold. The story of nuclear weapons will have an ending. It is up to us to decide what that ending will be. Will it be the end of nuclear weapons? Or will it be the end of us? Several Nobel Peace Prize laureates have contributed to the stigmatization of nuclear weapons and the spread of knowledge and awareness of their consequences. I do not bring with me today a definitive solution to the problems of war. What I do know is that meeting these challenges will require the same vision, hard work, and persistence of those men and women who acted so boldly decades ago. And it will require us to think in new ways about the notions of just war and the imperatives of a just peace. I believe that there is a greater power in the world than the evil power of military force, of nuclear bombs. There is the power of good, of morality, of humanitarianism. Linus Pauling, 1962. Imagine what would happen if the nation of the world spent as much on development as on the machines of war. Imagine a world when we settle our differences through dialogue and diplomacy and not through bombs and bullets. Imagine that the only nuclear weapons remaining are the relics in our museums. Imagine the legacy we could leave to our children. Imagine that such a world is actually within our grasp. Dare we believe that the leaders of the world's great nations will wake up, see the precipice towards which they are heading and change direction? All mankind is now learning that these nuclear weapons can only serve to destroy, never become beneficial. Alva Myrdal, 1982. The quest for a war-free world has a basic purpose, survival. But if in the process we learn how to achieve it by love rather than fear, by kindness rather than compulsion, above all, remember your humanity. Joseph Rotblatt, 1995. They are just weapons. They are just tools. And just as they were created by geopolitical context, they can just as easily be destroyed by placing them in a humanitarian context. In today's world, dialogue and negotiations are the best instruments for resolving even the most difficult international conflicts. As the culmination of years of efforts through the action of ordinary people, a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons was negotiated and concluded at the United Nations in 2017. 122 nations came together, hence sending a clear signal to the nine nations with nuclear weapons. We want our future to be safe. In the words of the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu, they claim that their bombs help keep the peace, but what peace can be maintained through threats of annihilation? On the morning you wake to the end of the world, your vision will be 2020. So use it, and maybe, just maybe, the world may not have to end again tomorrow.
Dear guests, welcome to the Nobel Peace Center. Please welcome on stage Dr. Shashti Flukstad. Dear everyone, welcome to the Nobel Peace Center. Welcome to this international summit on the nuclear threat. We know that a nuclear explosion would cause insurmountable challenges to humanitarian assistance. No state or humanitarian organization is prepared to respond to the enormous needs that a nuclear explosion would create. What we cannot prepare for, what we cannot respond to, we must pre prevent. These words were stated by Helen Durham from the International Red Cross a few months ago. And this is exactly what this conference is all about. And this is what the campaign on the morning you wake is all about. Nuclear weapons must never be used. It must be prevented. Nobel Peace Center is a proud partner of the international campaign on the morning you wake. A campaign that aims to bring even more urgency to the conversation about nuclear weapons. Storytelling is a powerful agent for change. And the intersection between art and technology is important in shaping the opinions of the public and our political leadership. Within three weeks, 42 school classes from high schools in Norway and many hundreds of visitors to the Nobel Center have been able to participate in this experience. You will all be invited to take part in the experience in section two of the conference today. During this conference, we will consider the challenges and threats of nuclear weapons from a broad perspective, while also discussing solutions. The campaign aims to transform feelings of helplessness into active and hopeful participation. This is also our aim for today's conference. The campaign was originally planned to be activated here at the Nobel Peace Center around Easter. But as Russia invaded Ukraine, we felt the situation of nuclear threat was so overwhelming, we, felt the uh, we decided to postpone. Today, the situation is no less relevant. The threat is not smaller, but we are able to discuss it with less emotional affection. The nuclear threat is in fact larger than ever. In our first section today, we will be listening to very strong voices who all have different aspects and engagements in the issue of nuclear weapons. Two of them have first-hand personal experience in how a nuclear threat feel in reality. At the Nobel Peace Center, we stand on the shoulders of 137 recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize, many of whom received the prize because of their fight against nuclear weapons. The first was Philip Noel Baker in 1959. The last was ICANN in 2017. In the third section today, you will, be among, you will, among other prominent speakers, meet representatives from organizations who have all received the Nobel Peace Prize because of the fight against the bomb. We present to you a busy and hopefully interesting three hours. It all ends with a celebration of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty's 25th anniversary, which is postponed from COVID-stricken December 21 until today. But first, without further ado, I have the whole great honor to welcome the mayor of Oslo, Marianne Borgen. She has personally and professionally been engaged in the agenda of today. And she told me that actually this agenda is why she became politically active in the first place. So very much welcome, Marianne. The floor is yours. Hi. Distinguished Nobel laureates, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends of peace, heartily welcome also to Oslo. As we meet today, there is a terrible war ongoing in Ukraine. Cities are under bombardment, lives and properties being destroyed. The terror and despair felt by millions of people is all but too real. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused the greatest refugee, refugee crisis since the Second World War. The fact that the invader even alludes 
to the possibility of using nuclear arms is terrifying. When we see what kind of nightmare conventional weapons have made in Mariupol, we can only imagine the consequences of a nuclear attack. However, President Putin's statement has confirmed explicitly the willingness of the world's most powerful states to continue to have arms that threaten the world with utter destruction. We know the realities from history. We know the true nature of nuclear weapons. They are city destroyers, weapons of human massacre. Should only one of these weapons explode in the sky above us now, we would all disappear. A city instantly wiped out, crushed, blown to pieces. Everything scorched and burning. For those remaining, it would be in a city of panic with almost no resources to help. Therefore, nations and cities must raise their voice against nuclear weapons. In Norway, Oslo, along with 68 other municipalities, support ICANN's city's appeal. Demand, demanding and also encouraging the Norwegian government to join the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And we are joined by an increasing number of parties and organizations. Only a few days ago, a landmark decision was taken by the Norwegian Confederation of Trade Unions, the LO, at their National Congress. Organizing almost a million workers in Norway, they now support the initiative and are putting an important pressure upon the national government to join the treaty. This decision is very important since they are, uh, since LO, this uh, Confederation of Trade Unions, are closely linked to the Social Democratic Party in our government. The new Norwegian government, which came to power in October last year, declared in its governmental platform that they will, and I will quote them, they will increase Norway's efforts for nuclear disarmament, take initiative to focus on the humanitarian consequences for nuclear weapons, and work with other countries within and outside of NATO for a world without nuclear arms." End of quote. Norway was, in that way, the first NATO country to confirm that they will participate as an observer at the state party meeting this month. It is a step in the right direction, but our hope is that Norway, along with the other Nordic countries and NATO members, can convince the Alliance that it is possible to be a loyal ally and at the same time work for the prohibition and abolishment of nuclear arms. I don't believe that these lines in the city government platform or in the uh, LO would have entered into the government's mindset without involvement from NGOs and municipalities all over Norway. I can promise you that we will follow closely how the government puts it into life, also connected to the first meeting in Vienna this month. In my view, cities can make a difference in working towards nuclear disarmament more broadly. Cities will suffer under an attack, but we are also resourceful. An obvious contribution would be to work with partners in raising public awareness about the real and utterly un unacceptable consequences of a nuclear attack. We are many. If put together, the voices of cities around the world will become stronger and it will lead to an impact. So, dear friends, let me conclude by thanking the organizers for this important summit. Thank you in particular to the Nobel Peace Prize Center, or Nobel Peace Center, not Nobel Peace Prize Center, but anyway, Nobel Peace Center, and to everyone here who have traveled from abroad. In the early days of the war in Ukraine, the president of Mayors of Peace and my dear colleague, Mayor of Hiroshima, Hiroshima Mr. Matsui Kasumi, he made an important statement. He said in the early uh, days of the war in, in, in Ukraine. He said, we have no time to lose. 
Being myself a proud member of Mayors for Peace, I will make Kusumi's words to mine. There is no time to lose. We must all stand up to the terror represented by nuclear weapons. The time for reacting and raising the public debate is now. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Dear guests, my name is Kim Rexton Grönberg. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Nobel Peace Center. I'll be your host for today. Thank you so much to Marianne Borgen. We're very proud to be living in a city where this is high up on the agenda. We are now uh, started on session one. Uh, it will be a plenum session for the next 45 minutes, focusing on the modern day nuclear threat and how to respond. You've already met uh, Kjersti Plukstad and uh, Marianne Borgen, and we have five more speakers coming up in this session that lasts until four o'clock. Session two consists of breakout sessions in the rotation, and you will also have a chance to mingle with your fellow guests. And session three will be in plenum and deals with the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. All talks from this stage will be streamed. To avoid a lengthy break for those watching online, session one, which we are in now, will be streamed as a recorded version starting at five local time, followed by a live stream at six. So over to the next speaker. I'm very happy to introduce Beatrice Finn. She's the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, known as ICANN, of course. Uh, the organization was awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize and works to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. Ms. Finn has led the campaign since 2014 and has worked to mobilize civil society throughout the development of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that entered into force in January last year. So please welcome on stage. Thank you so much to the Nobel Peace Center, Kerstin. Uh, thank, you, thank you to my uh, Mayor Borgen from Oslo. It's so nice to be here in Oslo, one of my favorite cities, uh, and I genuinely mean it. <laughs> a lot of great memories from here. Um, I'm here just to give a little bit of an overview uh, of the current geopolitical situation and what it means for the future of nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament. As it happens, um, The Economist magazine just published this week uh, a cover story dealing with exactly this topic. It's titled A New Nuclear Era, and it reviews how Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its threats to use nuclear weapons have really exaggerated the already growing nuclear risks worldwide. It notes that the erosion of the norm against use of nuclear weapons and the two conclusions that other countries might draw from Russia's successful use of nuclear coercion. First, that non-nuclear weapon states might decide that acquiring nuclear weapons or joining a nuclear umbrella is the best way to defend themselves against a nuclear armed aggressor. And second, that other nuclear armed states might decide to try nuclear coercion themselves. And it's actually a surprisingly good analysis for The Economist uh, and worth a read. But what really struck me was the title, A New Nuclear Era. And this idea that something fundamental change has had taken place with respect to the dangers that nuclear weapons pose to all of us. Because the dangers haven't really changed. They have been there all along. Russia's actions haven't actually brought about a new nuclear era. They've brought out the unacceptable dangers of the existing ones out in the open. Basically, Russia said the silent part of nuclear deterrence out loud. And since Russia began its invasion of Ukraine, we've seen a number of realities about nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence demonstrated in a way that cannot be ignored by people anymore. First, a nuclear armed state, a party to the NPT, even one of the depository states, is using its nuclear weapons not to preserve peace and stability, as nuclear armed states consistently claim, but to illegally invade a non-nuclear weapon state, to coerce and intimidate, to facilitate aggression, to restrict the ability of the international community to respond, and to provide a cover for war crimes and violations of human rights. And the second thing that has been obvious is that some of the NATO countries' own nuclear arsenals, its treasured nuclear deterrent, has proved to be quite useless in preventing or responding to this kind of nuclear coercion. 
it's evident that whatever the benefits of nuclear deterrence might argue be, preventing nuclear blackmail is not among them. So faced with blatant and illegal aggression by nuclear armed states, uh, we might end up in a situation where NATO's option can be crudely summarized as A, watching, or two, B, end the world. And third, we've seen an almost casual willingness to consider and envisage the use of nuclear weapons with no regard to the actual impact of such use. Not just by Putin uh, and also Russian state media, but also a seemingly endless array of analysts and commentators who discuss the possibilities of using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine, or that we shouldn't be so scared of Russia's nuclear threats. Uh, we should call their bluffs. But without really examining the catastrophic humanitarian consequences and the colossal destruction and disruption that any such use of any type of nuclear weapon would cause, including in Russia. So what we have right now is therefore what we have for decades, a deeply flawed notion of deterrence and security that risks triggering global humanitarian catastrophe. But what is different is that this is now much more obvious, immediate and very difficult to ignore, especially here in Europe. The current crisis demonstrates that the nuclear deterrence status quo is neither safe nor sustainable. And this is certainly something that we can use in reinvigorating global efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. And more specifically, I think it's obvious to everyone that Ukraine will never be safe as long as Russia has nuclear weapons. And Europe will never be safe as long as Russia has nuclear weapons. And no country in the world will be safe as long as there are nuclear weapons. It doesn't matter which countries have nuclear weapons, how many they have, what kind of they can have, or where they are based. The only way to prevent things like Russia's nuclear coercion is to remove nuclear weapons. And allowing the continued reliance on nuclear deterrence is right now only legitimizing threats and nuclear blackmail. And any resolution of the current crisis, therefore, will only really endure in the long term and will only really pro provide real security if it also includes negotiated elimination of Russia's nuclear weapons, if necessary, linked to sanctions relief. And since, of course, it's not realistic to expect that Russia disarms unilaterally, this in turn implies a negotiated elimination of all nuclear weapons worldwide. So this is really the time for governments driven by public concern to urgently renew and reinvigorate serious multilateral efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons completely in Russia and worldwide. And fortunately, we have the necessary legal structure for this in the form of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The TPNW, as it's called, is the appropriate legal vehicle for pursuing the total elimination of nuclear weapons in Russia and worldwide under strict and effective international control. And now that the treaty has entered into force, as it did in January 2021, its states' parties are in the per perfect position to drive and lead a return to serious multilateral nuclear disarmament. And even states that are not yet ready to join the TPNW should take a more co cooperative and collaborative approach to the TPNW and work constructively with its membership, including at the first meeting of states' parties in Vienna later this month. And I'm really pleased that Norway has decided to participate as an observer in this meeting, and I hope that the Norwegian government will persuade many of its NATO partners to do the same. And because reinvigorating nuclear disarmament efforts will take time, this is a long-term plan. In the meantime, we also simultaneously need urgent steps to reduce the risk of the use of nuclear weapons right now. And this means that the international community must strongly and consistently condemn all nuclear threats and reverse the trend towards this normalization of use that we're seeing right now. We need to emphasize the unacceptable humanitarian impact of any use of nuclear weapons and work collectively to stigmatize and delegitimizing them. And this is another area where Norway urgently needs to strengthen its work. And it's also that, this kind of area where projects like On the Morning You Wake can make an important contribution by raising public awareness of the reality and immediacy of the nuclear weapons threats. And the TPNW is also a key component in that effort. Now that the TPNW is in legal force, 
nuclear weapons are comprehensively banned under international law, as biological and chemical weapons have been for decades. And this is, of course, not a magical cure, uh, but it does provide a crucial foundation for building a global norm against nuclear weapons. And it will not happen overnight, but I'm confident that with the raised level of government and public concern due to Russia's threats, and as the membership of the TPNW grows, and as we see more educational projects like the, uh, this On the Morning You Wake, for example, we will enter into a truly new nuclear era, where nuclear weapons are universally rejected by all nations and all people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beatrice. It's nice to have you back in one of your favorite cities. <laughs> Kjell Begland is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for International Studies at Sciences Po in Paris. He is focusing on nuclear weapons, disarmament, and diplomacy. He's also a lecturer in international security and strategy at the Paris School of International Affairs and a researcher at the Norwegian Academy of International Law. Welcome on stage. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you so much to the organizers for, for having us. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to be here in such uh, incredibly distinguished uh, company this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, laureates, committee members, friends. I'm going to argue today that the stories that are told about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that is the interpretations that are, that, that are advanced about what the war means and why it went the way it did, are going to play a decisive role in determining nothing less than the fate of the Earth. The dominant story we hear today is the following. Everything changed on the 24th of February 2020. 2022, when Russian forces swept into Ukraine to wrest control from the government in Kyiv. The illegal Russian invasion shattered the European security architecture, revealing the ruthless, malicious character of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. The return of geopolitics now obliges the West to increase its military spending, modernize its nuclear weapons and push back against authoritarian forces. The alternative narr narrative, which I must admit I find more persuasive, is that the Russian invasion of Ukraine was less a turning point than a heartbreaking confirmation of things we already knew. After all, we already knew that the incumbent Russian government was and remains a brutal organization with a proven track record of using violence and other dirty tricks in pursuit of its aims. The sieges of Grozny in 1995 and 2000, the Litvinenko poisoning in 2006, the invasion of Georgia in 2008, the interference in Crimea and war in eastern Ukraine from 2014 onwards, the election meddling in the United States in 2016, and the attempted assassination by chemical weapon in Salisbury in 2018 are just some of the skeletons in Mr. Putin's closet. The war in Ukraine is bigger than the wars in Georgia and Chechnya, I'm sure. But perhaps the most surprising feature of the war has been the relative ineffectiveness of the Russian military. If anything, the Russian military threat to the rest of Europe now appears less serious than many of us had thought. The idea that Russia's armed forces could successfully mount an attack and invade large swathes of Western, Central or Northern Europe now seems absurd. Nevertheless, it is the former narrative, the narrative that the West must rearm in the face of an all-conquering Eastern foe, that is the dominant one. While I would not for a moment dispute that there are serious security implications associated with the war, or that we, we must stand up to imperialist aggression, I'm wary that the military decisions that are taken now in countries like the United States and Germany will lock in spending priorities, government spending priorities, that are incompatible with other goals. Let me put this very clearly. Substantial increases in military spending at the expense, at the expense of investments into green technologies 
is not consistent with keeping global warming to less than two degrees Celsius. The climate, quite simply, cannot bear a new arms race. I bet many of you here did not know that the world's militaries already emit substantially more carbon than the entire global shipping and civil aviation industries combined. To borrow a phrase from a former Norwegian prime minister, everything is connected with everything. The specifically nuclear narratives associated with the war will also shape policy and risks going forward. Conclusions about nuclear utility or disutility could impact decisions about proliferation and ultimately the wider risk landscape for years to come. I'm sometimes asked which strategies or theories I think the war proves or disproves. But these discussions tend to get awfully abstract very quickly and nuclear weapons, problematically, are often short-circuited with concepts such as strength, power and security. So let's look at the specifics. Let's, for the sake of argument, pretend that Ukraine had a nuclear arsenal like the one that was left on Ukrainian territory when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. In other words, an arsenal of a few thousand nuclear warheads, some tactical, some strategic. When and how would the Ukrainian forces have used these weapons? Surely not against Russian forces on Ukrainian soil. That would have utterly destroyed large parts of Ukraine itself. And the conventional weapons Ukraine is in fact using, perhaps most notably Turkish drones, appear to be highly effective in military terms. So if Ukraine wouldn't have used these weapons against Russian forces inside Ukraine, perhaps it would have used them against Russian cities or major military infrastructure on the other side of the border. Well, this would almost certainly have constituted war crimes, and it would have invited a response in kind from Putin. It would have quite likely meant the end of Ukraine as a nation and a humanitarian, environmental and health crisis far beyond what we have today, with huge impacts far beyond the national borders of the belligerents. I've written that in this war, nuclear weapons are simultaneously everything and nothing. Nothing because beyond arguably deterring other countries from intervening more directly on the side of Ukraine, Nuclear weapons do not appear to offer much utility in this conflict. And everything, because if things suddenly go wrong, human civilization as we know it could end. Along with other experts, I've been responding to readers' questions about the war on NRK.no. The questions may not be fully representative of the general population, but it is nevertheless interesting to get some insight into what people are worried about and what premises they base their questions on. Perhaps most striking to me has been the number of questions based on a notion, or at least hope, that someone or something out there would be able to stop Russia's nuclear missiles if Putin would really go off the rails and push the large button. There must be a plan B wrote a reader who did not fully accept my answers about the limitations of civil defense and missile interception. I'm sorry to say there is no plan B. There is no missile defense that can stop modern nuclear-headed cruise missiles with an acceptable margin of error. Long-range ballistic missiles are even harder to stop. We only have plan A, which is to avoid the use of these weapons in the first place. But the questions about missile defense testify to a fundamental unwillingness to acknowledge the existential vulnerability that has characterized human history since the 1950s. As the English author Martin Amis put it, we are all in the military. Every single spot on the Earth's, Earth's surface can be reached and destroyed by a nuclear warhead in just over half an hour. And a couple of thousand nuclear weapons are at all times ready for launch at short notice. Our babies are born, not in their birthday suits, but in uniform, writes Avis. We are all on the front line. Readers at NRK have also asked detailed questions about the use of so-called tactical versus strategic nuclear weapons and about the effects of using so-called low-yield, more precise nuclear arms against hypothetical targets in Ukraine. Such questions are important but we are to some extent in danger of missing the forest for the trees. 
The whole point of a nuclear warhead is to cause extreme damage. The Hiroshima bomb, a relatively small nuclear weapon by modern standards, had an explosive power equivalent to 1,500 units of the most powerful conventional bomb in Russia's current arsenal. In fact, nuclear weapons are so big, they have left their mark not just on the human story, but on the story of the planet. The beginning of the Anthropocene, the proposed geological epoch we are now in after a mere 11,700 years of the Holocene, is dated by the Scientific Association Working Group on the Anthropocene to the early 1950s, when the Great Power's nuclear testing campaigns recreated the Earth's surface in man's nuclear image. The broader question, I suppose, is what lessons the war in Ukraine will imply for nuclear strategy, non-proliferation and disarmament. For me, our rediscovery of our nuclear vulnerability should be a call for serious and a carefully thought out strategy to push back against nuclear weapons. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is one instrument designed to do just that. Proponents of the TPNW have, however, been accused of sowing polarization in the international community. I find such arguments difficult to accept. We must be clear-eyed, I think, that it is not and will not be possible to achieve nuclear disarmament without anyone getting upset. In other words, without acute disagreements and rearguard actions by the powers that be, in short, polarization. Pundits and diplomats love to say that everyone agrees about the vision of a world without nuclear weapons and that any disagreements are about implementation. This is simply not the case. Nuclear armed leaders' talk of abolition has for decades been belied by their government's actions. Nuclear modernization programs, non-implementation of consensus disarmament agreements, explicit nuclear threat making, and repeated statements about the necessity and legitimacy of nuclear deterrence. Vladimir Putin and the oligarchs that make their money through the Russian military industrial complex do not want to disarm. On the contrary, they continuously seek to legitimize nuclear weapons. For example, the Russian, uh, Russian diplomats routinely, and it must be said with a modicum of justification, argue that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, gives them a right to possess nuclear weapons. The Russian Orthodox Church is regularly invited to take part in ceremonies jointly with Russia's nuclear forces. Priests habitually sprinkle holy water on Russia's intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear submarines. Russian nuclear bomber cockpits and submarine control rooms almost universally carry religious icons, with Saint Seraphim of Sarov being the nuclear force's official patron saint. Russian state broadcasters incessantly project the conspiratorial narrative that Russia is surrounded by enemies bent on aggression that can only be deterred with nuclear force. Other nuclear armed states have their own practices of legitimation. In the United States, nuclear defense contractors spend millions each year on donations to think tanks, lobbyists, and political election campaigns with the aim of shaping public discourse and policy. The United States' last two ministers of defense, one under the Trump administration and one under the Biden administration, both came to their jobs at the Pentagon from jobs at Raytheon, one of the world's largest nuclear weapons makers. The various practices of legitimation referred to above are in a way quite depressing. But they should also be a source of hope for those seeking nuclear restraint. After all, they show that nuclear weapons are vulnerable. They're vulnerable to ridicule, to normative contestation, to lawfare, to censure, to acts of resistance, in short, to change. Otherwise, there would be no need to place little icons inside nuclear submarines and bombers. There would be no need to spend millions on donations to think tanks for them to promote nuclearism. To again quote Amos, this is a human story and human pressures, human mobilizations can be brought to bear upon it. I don't think we can expect the nuclear weapon states to disarm if nobody puts pressure on them to do so. And we certainly cannot avoid so-called polarization if we actually make a want to make a difference. 
the people and movements who promoted the campaigns against nuclear testing knew this. And today, we can enjoy the fruits of their labor. My warmest congratulations today to the CTBT community and to NORSA on the anniversary. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sjölv Eglan, for uh, that insightful speech. A bit scary, but also thank you for leaving us with a glimmer of hope in the end and making it even clearer that we must pursue Plan A. Our next speaker, Anne Strömmelike, is the CEO of NORSAR. NORSAR is an independent research foundation and the Norwegian National Data Center for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Lika has held high-level positions in several large en energy companies. She has extensive international experience and is chairman and member of various boards. Please take the stage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was a bit eager there. Thank you, Chöl, for the congratulation. Uh, I will bring you some technical insights into the uh, area of disarmament. We are, as Shelv said, marking the 25th year anniversary for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty together with you. And we are very happy to invite you all to the reception afterwards. And I do look forward to having an, an interesting day with you. And um, I'm afraid after hearing Shalg uh, and uh, our it, it will not be that easy to sleep tonight. Um, but after 25 years, the treaty is still standing solid. The major accomplishment of the treaty is it that it represents a de facto ban on nuclear explosions. And that is important. And then there is a side to it too that is also important that this community is able to upheld technical discussions on how to develop and maintain the system across all member states. Where Russia actually is one of the eager members. And I think it's also important in our challenging times that we remember that the treaty was negotiating during the Cold War. It took scientists and diplomats 25 years in patient work in Geneva to prepare for the treaty to pave the way for its unique verification system and uh, to choose uh, a design and systems and technology that could be commonly trusted and could be solid and stay the course of time. And now we have over 300 stations across the globe with several instruments each. So it's a huge system and it makes sure that no one, no one can explode at a bomb without at least two member states seeing it immediately. And the system covers the earth its ground, its atmosphere and air, and its waters. And you will see examples of this detection capability in one of the breakout sessions today. So I do hope that you will enjoy that. And, and, and the fact is that from the early US testing in the 40s and through the appalling bombing of, uh, in Japan during the war, more than 2000 bombs have been exploded until the treaty was adopted by the UN in 1996. And so far, 186 countries have signed up to the treaty. Most of them has ratified it. But it must be admitted that we have come into challenging times. And it's sad to say that the CTBT and its verification system yet again is highly relevant. And it is a key source to uh, objective and trusted information. And using North Korea as an example, the claim that they made that they had the bomb was at first very hard to believe. Really? But the system could actually verify that. We can say rather immediately for Norway sitting on the other side of the globe after 10 minutes, how big? Where was it? When was it? And why is that important? Well, that is important because objective, trusted facts are the basis for dealing with 
culprits like North Korea. And it's important that we agree on the facts. And that is one of the major achievements of the test ban treaty is that the facts that they, the verification system produces are agreed and trusted. The big challenge for CTBT going forward is its maintenance and operation, which is costly. And in a divided world where uh, resources are scarce, we still need to actually come together and make this continue. And um, um, I think that is uh, one of the major challenges for, for us as a national data center going forward to help promote the sustainment of the system. And another major uh, challenge with the system of the treaty is that it's actually not formally ratified or entered into force. We are lacking eight countries. The most notable one being its largest contributor, and that is the United States. And when that is going to happen, uh, that is for nobody to know. Uh, but if we are in an optimistic mode, uh, maybe as the previous speaker left us with a glimpse of hope too, the treaty was negotiated during the Cold War. And, uh, and it took them 25 years and we have uh, uh, a member of that negotiation team here today. Uh, it's very nice to see him. And uh, that patience and that stamina is something that we need to bring into our work. And I think it's now our responsibility to take it upon ourselves through science and diplomacy to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. So with that encouragement, I hope you will have a nice day and I look forward to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Annelike, and a reminder to everyone that you can experience how Norshara works in the breakout sessions later on. Our next speaker is Sharon Weiner. She's a res senior res resident fellow with the Carnegie Corporation of New York. While serving in this role, uh, Weiner has a leave of absence from her position as an associate professor at American University School of International Service. Here, her teaching, research, and policy engagement are at the intersection of organizational politics and US national security. Her work also focuses on civil military relations and nuclear weapons programs and non-proliferation. Please. Thanks very much. So what he left out is that I was actually born at Strategic Air Command. I was born in the base hospital um, and I grew up on a farm in the middle of Missouri. That's Missouri to those of you who are not from there. And we were downwind from Whiteman Air Force Base. And we lived in the knowledge that had there ever been a war, a nuclear war with the Soviet Union, we would die from fallout. There were 150 ICBMs stationed there. And until 1995, when they were eliminated, those ICBMs were operational. And had the Soviet Union launched nuclear weapons, the presumption was we had less than 30 minutes to live. Now, I give you these biographic details because this is my lived experience with nuclear weapons. Now, most of you here in the crowd, for some reason, there was something that connected you to nuclear weapons and made you want to do something about the threat posed by them. It may be just to come here or to listen in or to view this on the web or to do something more than that. But this makes you exceptional because the vast majority of people don't pay any attention at all to nuclear weapons, or they think of them only slightly. They've receded into the background or they're not uh, considered at all until something like Russia's invasion of Ukraine pops up and people pay attention for just a few moments. Well, the history of the nuclear era is the history of people who are worried about nuclear dangers trying to find a way to connect other people, to make them pay attention to that threat. Because without attention, there's no leverage. And without leverage, there's no change. So there have been a variety of efforts during um, the last, what, 60 some odd years to convince people to pay just a little more attention to nuclear weapons. And they've taken a variety of forms. So they started off with the scientists themselves who worked on nuclear weapons. Or they start off with, for example, Albert Einstein. 
In Princeton, New Jersey, the city where I live now, in 1946, he helped found the Emergency Committee of the Atomic Scientists. And so these scientists used their scientific expertise to try and engage people through talks, through lectures, through radio shows, in one case even through movie, to pay attention to nuclear weapons, to, to acknowledge the danger that they posed. The scientists inspired mus musicians. So one of the earliest songs about nuclear weapons was an American, it goes as a folk song, it's called Old Man Adam. Right, and I'm not going to sing this, so don't worry. Um, but the, some of the lyrics go, I'm going to preach you all a sermon about old man Adam, the thing that Einstein said he's scared of. And if when Einstein's scared, brother, you should be scared too. And it goes on to say, we hold these truths, truths to be self-evident. All men may be cremated equal. Some years later, perhaps a musician you're more familiar with, Bob Dylan, in an interview with Rolling Stone in 2007, he said the atomic bomb fueled the entire world that came after it. It showed that indiscriminate killing and indiscriminate homicide on a mass level was possible. Whereas if you looked at warfare up until that point, you had to see somebody to shoot them or maim them. You had to look at them. You don't have to do that anymore. I'm sure that fueled all aspects of society. I know it gave rise to the music we were playing. This is Bob Dylan trying to connect people to the nuclear threat. Artists. One of Salvador Dali's first exhibitions was about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. He said, the atomic explosion of August the 6th, 1945 shook me seismically. Many of the landscapes painted in this period exp expressed the great fear inspired in me by the announcement of that explosion. Or Jackson Pollock. If you think about Jackson Pollock's art, he says you couldn't paint in the way that Renaissance painters had painted after you knew about nuclear weapons. Lots of books. There have been books written, fictionalized accounts of the world after nuclear war, and actual accounts of the world after nuclear war. So for example, John Hershey, who wrote in 1946 about the effects of the bombing on Hiroshima for the New Yorker magazine, which then became a book. That issue of the magazine sold out. The article was read over the radio. Parts of it were printed in newspapers. Three million copies of Hershey's Hiroshima sold, and it has been in print ever since 1946. So as, a, as an academic, one can only hope to <laughs> right, set such standards. Um, Novelists have written countless dystopian stories about nuclear weapons, about nuclear war, about the path to a nuclear apocalypse and how to prevent it. Film. Lots of examples of film, right? Film was the major new technology after World War II. This was the thing that tried to get people interested in the nuclear dangers. And of course, there have been movies about uh, nuclear war, the effects of radiation, Escapism, even a few atomic generated monsters that come out of different places to scare you. And of course, television. And here, one of the prime examples is a movie that was aired in the United States in 1983 called The Day After. It was also shown a few years later on Soviet state TV. And US President Ronald Reagan credits this movie as changing his attitude about whether or not a nuclear war could be won. And so I give you this context because it's in this context that you're going to be invited to see on the morning you wake, a virtual reality experience. So virtual reality, obviously, is the new technology. This is the fun thing, and trust me, it's the thing you all want to do if you haven't done it before. Um, but part of the hope is that some people will be just intrigued enough by the technology to decide, let me go watch this thing, even though it's about nuclear weapons. But virtual reality also holds the promise of helping you engage with the nuclear weapons issue on a different level, not just by being present in an experience, but by being immersed in it. And immersed, if you, when you put on the headset, you realize you're immersed all around. It's 360 degrees. So the promise of virtual reality is that it will help you be immersed in another person's lived experience about nuclear weapons with the goal being that that will hopefully be the final motivation that makes people move from not caring, not thinking, not noticing, to trying to exert some leverage over that nuclear danger. Thank you very much for coming today, and thank you for hosting us.
Thank you, Sharon, for expanding this to the popular history. And I can definitely echo, echo your, your point about uh, the students who have been to the Peace Center so far and experienced uh, on the morning awake activation. We can see that their interest in the topic has, has peaked after taking part. So um, that's very uh, encouraging. Our next speaker, Dr. Tamara Lilino Patton, is a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at MIT. She's an executive producer of the VR film on the morning awake that we just talked about which you will experience later, and a partner with Games for Change. She holds a PhD in Public and International Affairs from Princeton University. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much to the Nobel Peace Center for having me and to all of you for being here. So I'm going to begin my remarks with a confession. Although I am an executive producer for the VR film you'll see today on The Morning You Wake, which depicts the nuclear threat in the context of a false ballistic missile alert in my birthplace of Hawaii, it took me a very long time to muster the courage to sit down, put on my headset, and watch the finalized version of the film. Don't get me wrong, I had great confidence in the creative team, I even already knew for the most part what I would see um, after years of listening to the raw audio, reviewing artwork samples and storyboards, and helping to refine the technical details concerning nuclear weapons along with my partners at Princeton. It's just that up until this point, there had always been a very clear separation between my often formidable work life as a researcher of nuclear weapons and disarmament and the happy bubble of my childhood home in Hawaii, where the large majority of my family and friends remain in our native Hawaiian community. This changed for me on January 13th, 2018. That day, as every resident of Hawaii received a text message instructing them to seek immediate shelter because a ballistic missile was inbound, my two separate worlds brutally collided. I will forever remember the frozen fear and grief that coursed through me when my family and friends reached out to me that day asking for my help. I will never forget the pain of feeling that I had failed them. Of course, my own experience pales in comparison to those who faced the perceived threat in the islands that day. And when you watch the film, you'll see that at times those interviewed really struggle to find the words um, to describe what they felt that day, myself included. So this film stands as an intricate tapestry of testimony, technology, music, soundscapes, and art that woven together attempt to capture and communicate a story. What is the story? A partial answer is that it is about nuclear violence and its constant presence in our lives now and historically. Hawaii's recent experience is certainly a far cry from those who have physically experienced the violence of nuclear weapons. From those who burned in Hiroshima and Nagasaki to those throughout the world who have had their bodies and lands poisoned by nuclear weapons production or testing, nuclear violence has physically affected generations of innocent people, most of whom were women children, indigenous communities, and other communities of color. As many of us well know, violence is not only defined by its physical form. If we look, for example, at the domain of domestic violence, we find legal definitions of violence in many forms. There is psychological or mental violence, emotional or verbal violence, and economic or financial abuse or violence. In short, the violence inflicted by nuclear weapons comes in many incarnations. The film on the morning you wake captures the nuclear violence experienced by those in Hawaii during the missile alert. In doing so, it counters the idea of war as something far away, of nuclear war as a mere distant possibility. In depicting the landscape of nuclear weapons aimed at cities, the film brings the shadow of war closer asking each viewer to consider what your own story would be if right now a message warning of an imminent threat, imminent nuclear threat, appeared on your phone. 
Whatever feelings come to you, again, there may not be words to describe them. This is nuclear violence at work. And it will exist for as long as nuclear weapons and the militarized structures that uphold them continue to exist. From here, one can ask, is this violence permanent? Will it always be this way? The answer, I think, forces us to consider whether nuclear weapons themselves are inevitable or rather a choice. One argument with a tenor of inevitability holds that nuclear weapons must be retained, else the world be made safe for conventional wars like those of the 20th century. But in watching the crisis of Ukraine unfold, many more are starting to question the logic and salience of nuclear deterrence, seeing for themselves how the presence of nuclear weapons can actually pave the way for leaders with malicious agendas to commit genocide and wage conventional war with relative impunity. Another argument invoking inevitability is that states must retain their nuclear weapons because their adversaries have them. In other words, that nuclear weapons are here to stay because they can never be uninvented. As someone who studies the science and technology of nuclear weapons and disarmament, my view is that while these weapons can indeed never be uninvented, they can certainly be unmade in an enduring and responsible manner. For decades, NGOs, think tanks, laboratories, and universities have designed a myriad of solid approaches and technologies to verifying the mutual dismantlement of nuclear arsenals. For missiles, dismantlement verification procedures are already very well developed. For warheads, proposed approaches to their authentication without revealing any sensitive information are ready and waiting to be used. For fissile material, approaches such as nuclear archaeology are advancing and ready to be called upon for better ensuring that such material is accounted for. In terms of structuring disarmament, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons offers a sound institutional framework for elaborating an internationally collaborative nuclear disarmament process. When these dimensions are considered, nuclear disarmament cannot in good faith be described as fanciful unrealistic or utopian, as it is often portrayed. With a comprehensive picture that accounts for te technological and institutional realities, nuclear disarmament is more accurately described as feasible, practical, technologically sound, and humane as a policy choice. The idea that the enduring violence brought to bear by nuclear weapons must be accepted because it is an inevitable part of international security is still being disseminated. But I also know that I am far from alone in believing that a more truthful assessment allows that nuclear weapons, like any other weapons, are a choice. This is another critical part of the story of the film on the morning you wake. That each day we wake, each day that our world does not end due to the use of devices of our own making, each day that we draw breath, we are free to choose differently. Coming back to my confession, I did eventually manage to sit down with clenched fists and watch the film. Words again fail me, so all I can say is that I am extremely grateful for what our many collaborators achieved, including Games for Change, Archer's Mark, Atlas V, Princeton's Program on Science and Global Security, and many, many others. You all help to tell a contemporary story that depicts the devastating truth of nuclear violence. And in further building the community dedicated to these issues, you have helped in taking forward the work to ensure this violence does not endure to harm future generations. So I will end my remarks with a brief quote from the film that comes from Dr. Jamaica Heolimele Kalani Osorio, a scholar, poet, and director of the film whose voice and guidance was essential for threading together the many pieces into a meaningful whole. In their words, on the morning you wake to the end of the world, your vision will be 2020, so use it. As the men with the plans called power call out from behind their screens to tell you to take cover, see beyond the violence of their contradiction, the enduring waste of their direction. Call upon your own mana to make a change. And maybe, just maybe, the world may not have to end again tomorrow. Thank you.
Thank you, Tamara, and thank you for taking part in creating On the Morning You Wake and concluding session one. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Nobel Peace Center, to those of you in the audience and to those of you who are joining us live on stream. We're going to start the final session of today with a panel talk, and let me introduce the participants of this talk. Dr. Cordula Dröge, she is the Chief Legal Officer of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Here, she leads the ICRC's efforts to uphold, implement, and develop international humanitarian law. She has some 20 years of experience in the field of humanitarian in international law. Please come up on stage uh, as I introduce you. Give her a warm applause. Um, probably, yeah, take a seat there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Carlos Umania, uh, he is a Costa Rican medical doctor and is currently co-president of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the NPPW. Give him a warm applause. He's also a member of the International Steering Group of ICANN, and we also would like to welcome back Beatrice Finn on stage. And to moderate the talk, we are thankful to also have Tamara Lilno Patton on stage again. Thank you so much, and enjoy. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this conversation is uh, focused on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons um, with our very esteemed panel here today. Um, to start off, so each of your organizations has been honored for your work on nuclear disarmament, yet each is of course very unique. Um, so I'm hoping you can start off by telling us more about the perspective and approach that your organizations have taken to the issue of humanitarian consequences and the endeavor of nuclear disarmament. Um, Cordula, could you maybe start us off with um, the perspective from the ICRC? Yes, thanks. And thanks very much for the Nobel Peace Center for having the, the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, having invited us here. So the International Committee of the Red Cross is an old humanitarian organization founded in 1863. And our approach to weapons issue is that we have uh, witnessed throughout you know, conflicts around the world the effects of weapons on people and the, the effects that they have uh, and the suffering that they cause. And particularly coming to nuclear weapons, the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, and the Japanese Red Cross actually were present a few days after the explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so they saw firsthand, they witnessed firsthand the destruction that it created. And immediately uh, afterwards, the International Committee of the Red Cross called for the total elimination of nuclear weapons, so since 1945. And we have constantly then uh, called for this. And in 2010, our president again uh, called really for an end to the era of nuclear weapons, saying that we have to shift the focus of the nuclear weapons discourse from, from a focus of national security and military strategy to a focus on you know, humanity, the reach of international humanitarian law, and what it really means for us to master the technology that we create, and what is the amount of suffering that we are ready to actually accept in, in conflict situations. Thank you. Um, and so we're sort of moving uh, forward in history here um, with the ICRC honored um, with the Nobel Peace Prize in 1944 and then 1963. And then that brings us to 1985 um, with the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. So Carlos, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. And thank you, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize Institute, for having us. Um, IPPNW International Physicians, Medical Doctors for the Prevention of Nuclear War, is a federation that mobilizes uh, medical doctors, medical students, healthcare professionals, and concerned citizens uh, who want to create a world that is peaceful and free from the threat of nuclear annihilation. IPPNW was uh, founded in 1980 by um, physicians from the United States and then um, the Soviet Union 
with uh, uh, the purpose of uh, creating awareness, creating public awareness on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. And they were credited at the time for um, creating policy changes and uh, um, dissuading or, or persuading uh, uh, Soviet and American leaders that uh, the threat posed, posed by the Cold War jeopardized the entire uh, humanity. Uh, we were awarded the 1985 Nobel Peace Prize, and I quote, for spreading authoritative information and creating awareness of the catastrophic consequences of nuclear war. And that basically sums up our work today, is evidence-based policymaking. It is placing science at the service of people and placing people at the center of policymaking and at the center of all the discussions related to the nuclear weapons issue. And what this means in practical terms is, of course, doing campaigning, uh, participating in forums, organizing forums, uh, publishing uh, uh, papers in journals, and creating relationships with other health, healthcare and science-based uh, organizations towards promoting uh, scientific diplomacy and evidence-based policymaking. Thank you. And as we know, despite this you know, incredibly valuable work being done throughout these decades, this problem has persisted to today. Um, so in 2017, we had ICANN um, awarded the Peace Prize. Um, so Beatrice, please. Yeah, um, I mean, of course, uh, working on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons is, was nothing new. It's been done since we first saw the consequences in 1945 from the ICRC, IPPNW, and many, many more. But it's worth reminding everyone about, and it's worth kind of re-energizing the fight over and over, because the natural state of policymakers is to drift into very theoretical security debates on this weapon and remove it away from reality and mm. what actually happens on the ground. So ICANN was actually founded by IPPNW uh, and then had all these other NGOs being invited to be part of, uh, of the coalition. And it's today uh, over 600 organizations that are part of this broad coalition in uh, over 108 countries, I think we have now. Uh, so really a massive movement of really, really diverse act actors. And I think that the reason why we focus so much on the humanitarian consequences is, first of all, it's the reality. It's what actually happens. This is not a theory, it is not an academic debate, it is hard cold truth about what happens when you use these weapons. Uh, so often when we talk about what would we do if someone used nuclear weapons, we talk about how would we retaliate with other nuclear weapons, but mm -hmm. that ignores the reality of the situation. What we would do is we would have to respond on the ground in a humanitarian sense and have to mm -hmm. sort of see what we would do with the people uh, that are injured or harmed or dead and the areas around it. Um, but that gets very little space in the conversations, in the policy conversations. So this whole coalition is really focused on bringing that up to the surface and you know, using that as the foundation. It was also part of, the, also of our um, uh, the, um, decision to get the Nobel Peace Prize, to give the Nobel Peace Prize. I can, it was for, for our work uh, on raising awareness of the catastrophic humanitarian consequences. And, and to me, it's also that it also becomes a really effective way of working because it really is truly like diversity in action, really, because it actually broadens the number of actors that have a voice in this. This is not just for the DC, London, Moscow expert people in suits. Um, this is also for bringing in survivors and impacted communities. It's to bring in the humanitarian organizations. It's to bring in all the other countries that don't have nuclear weapons but still would suffer the impact. Uh, it's to bring in young people, for example, and it's to bring in um, you know, all these different actors that will help strengthen this issue and help being able to create solutions that are actually you know, from, from all of society that will solve this problem, not just for a very narrow, mm -hmm. small part. So mm -hmm. that's really the, why we're working on this issue from that perspective and why I can has that as a fundamental sort of root cause to why we need to ban and eliminate nuclear weapons. Thank you so much. Um, so Carlos, as we think about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons in our current moment, um, 
What comes to your mind when you observe the threats of nuclear weapon use surrounding the conflict in Ukraine? And again, we're talking about peeling back the, sanit the sanitizing <laughs> of the language. Oof, well, uh, to be uh, quite honest, it's, uh, I'm incredibly concerned, and we, and IPPW, we're incredibly concerned, and we agree with the experts that say that the risk of a nuclear war right now is very high, and perhaps the highest that it has ever been. Now, let me break that to you, um, specifically when we talk about a, a nuclear war and we talk about a nuclear detonation. Um, one uh, nuclear weapon, one tactical nuclear weapon of a yield of 100 kilotons, if it is detonated in a large city, it can cause uh, hundreds, like hundreds of thousands of immediate deaths, many more people injured, and when we're talking about injured people, we're also talking not only the physical effects of the shock wave and the heat, but also the radiation. And uh, the injured people from radiation have acute uh, radiation syndrome, which can be a very painful uh, uh, suffering that uh, causes the breakdown of uh, vital organs and systems. Now, because of the destruction of the infrastructure and because of the radiation, it is, it is not possible to have um, first emergency respond. The Red Cross will not be able to uh, externally come in and help. So these people with this uh, terrible suffering will have to suffer and die alone. Those who do survive will have chronic radiation syndrome, which includes several types of cancer, includes uh, several immune system um, failures. It also includes birth defects and intergenerational um, effects such as uh, an increased incidence of cancer. Now, this is one detonation. But when we're talking about a nuclear war, we're not talking about one or two detonations. We're talking about multiple detonations over multiple cities, and perhaps of a much larger yield than 100 kilotons. So this would mean hundreds of millions of immediate deaths, many more people injured, a vast environmental devastation, and a vast radiation pollution that would spread towards the entire world. But it would also mean a nuclear winter. A nuclear winter is what happens when the suits and debris that rise to the stratosphere because of the burning, um, that, bl that blocks the sunlight in a very intense manner. Uh, the temperature is reduced drastically, and to put it frankly, there are, there are very few food chains, there are very few ecosystems that will actually be able to survive that drastic change in temperature and the prolonged block of sunlight. So this nuclear winter will, would mean the demise of our civilization and the demise of many, many species, perhaps even our own. Now the risk of this happening is actually not low. Before this war, well, we have, there, there are approximately, Shilv mentioned it before, about 1,800 uh, nuclear uh, weapons in the state of high alert. That means that they are uh, ready to be detonated within minutes. And these systems are linked to alert systems that uh, uh, are vulnerable to cyber attacks and vulnerable to human and technical error. And they have actually been activated by false alarms such as flocks of geese or uh, storm clouds. Now, in a context such as the one that we are right now, in which there have been many uh, um, explicit nuclear threats, in which many red lines have already been crossed, the uh, probability for uh, uh, misunderstandings or miscalculations is very high, and that one of these misunderstandings or miscalculations could lead to a nuclear detonation. Now, if we cross the threshold of a nuclear detonation, the possibility of this escalating to a nuclear war is high. Like, there's many, many things that can go wrong in this context. And from a nuclear war, there's basically no going back. So yes, we're concerned. <laughs> Before we lose all hope, <laughs> another reason that 2022 is notable is it is the, going to be the first meeting of states' parties of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, as we know, this is the first international agreement to explicitly capture the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons in the context of a treaty. Um, Beatrice, can you tell us more about the intentions and the thinking behind this decision? 
Well, I mean, I think everyone who just heard Carlos is sort of agrees that that can't happen. Like, we can't let that happen. Um, and of course, I'm pretty confident that there's very few people on Earth who want to see nuclear war happening. Hopefully nobody. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's been this kind of underlying um, inconsistencies that you know, all governments in the world, uh, like much like they did with climate change, commit to 1.5 degrees and you know, big ceremony, Paris Agreement, get the goal, but nothing concrete about how to do it. We all have agreed uh, almost all governments of the world have agreed to eliminate nuclear weapons. That the goal is a world without nuclear weapons, but no concrete commitments. And what was more problematic is that you, many governments, um, including the nuclear armed states and all countries under uh, nuclear umbrella, agreed that the goal is eliminating nuclear weapons, but also that nuclear weapons protect us and keep us safe. So there's this kind of inherent friction there uh, and kind of illogical um, thinking around nuclear weapons, that we have to get rid of them because they're really dangerous, but they also protect us and keep us safe. And how can we then eliminate something like that? So really the whole, whole basis like, was really to look at, again, not the theories, discard all the theories, the kind of wishful thinking, this almost religion of nuclear deterrence, uh, mm -hmm. where people just believe in it, uh, and look at the facts, look at the science, uh, look at the people who will handle the consequences, uh, what the Red Cross knows about nuclear weapons, what the doctors know about nuclear weapons, what the survivors who have lived through this know about nuclear weapons, and form our policy re response based on that. And that is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, that if we are actually going to get rid of this weapon, we need to ban it. So the treaty was negotiated by around 120 governments, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2017. It entered into force after 50 countries ratified it in, 20, in January 2021. Uh, and now it's the first meeting of states parties. And what makes this treaty so important is that it's really the only sort of global rejection of nuclear weapons, saying, no, we don't believe in this weapon. Um, and previous instruments that are very valuable, the MPT, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, all of us who sat up there thinks it's super cool. Uh, they are all really useful tools, but they did not reject nuclear weapons. The threats that we see today by Russia is not illegal under any other instrument than the TPNW. And I think that that's a really, that's why it's so important, right? To draw this kind of line. Uh, and I think again, like I'm very passionate supporter of international law. I think it's an extremely important tool as the world gets more and more complex and uh, gray zones uh, of behavior are there and our allies sometimes do things that are really bad and our enemies are doing things that are also really bad and how do we distinguish between this and what do we support and what do we reject? International law is our kind of moral compass there that gives us a sign this is okay behavior and this is unacceptable behavior. Mm. I think that's what we see with the Geneva Conventions, for example, that you know, we have to be able to criticize our allies and friends when they do things that violate international law. And we have to be able to criticize our enemies when they, you know, when they violate international law, not just one or the other in that way. So that's why this treaty sets this new kind of norm in the international community that what Russia did, threatening to use nuclear weapons, is unacceptable. And what I mentioned earlier today when I spoke is sort of they, they really articulated what deterrence is all about. They said the silent part out loud. And you can see that a lot of countries that rely on nuclear weapons are in this kind of squirmish position now. Like, how do we deal with this? Because we don't, we reject that, we condemn it. But also we can't condemn it too much because we still want to reserve the right to do that ourselves one day. And that's what really kind of brings this treaty right now and, and the meeting of states parties to the forefront. That this is really the genuinely only place where we can mobilize a strong international response to Russia's nuclear threats. I mean, there's been other responses in other places that are very, very important. Um, but to the nuclear dynamic, and, and hopefully we can also use it to um, encourage some countries that are very close to Russia and close allies to Russia to be able to use that treaty, use this line in the sand to condemn behavior that violates this new norm. Mm. Uh, so I think it's, it's going to be a really important meeting where we're going to hopefully get a lot of governments to send a strong message to the nuclear arms states that threatening to use nuclear weapons, like Russia did, is unacceptable. And we need to kind of raise the threshold there. Thank you so much. 
Um, so connecting the treaty with, as you mentioned, this compass of international law, um, Cordula, as an expert in the evolution of international humanitarian law, uh, how would you contextualize our current moment and what still needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, and, and I'll sort of uh, go from, from where, where Bea also, um, in a way, indicated. So I think there are several things we can say about international law. First of all is that, at least from the perspective of the ICRC, we, we very early on emitted serious doubts as to whether the use of nuclear weapons can be compatible with international humanitarian law. This is because international humanitarian law requires parties to conflicts to distinguish between civilians and military and mm. between civilian objects and military objectives. Nuclear weapons are not containable in time and space, and therefore it's difficult to understand how they could possibly be compatible with international humanitarian law. So I think that's the first thing to say. Second, when you say contextualize, of course we are at the moment, and that's what, um, what Carlos was also saying, and, and Beatrice, you know, we are in a moment where the, the theory of deterrence is sort of revived a little bit, and that's of concern to us. And the TPNW um, creates this norm um, about, uh, you know, the complete prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons. And it is for the member states, of course, or for the states parties to the treaty, it's a legal norm. But it is also a norm in the political sense, not legal sense, which is much broader. Because it's a norm of behavior, a norm that stigmatizes the use of nuclear weapons. And I think that's also something that evolves. Mm. And then thirdly, there was already, with the Nuclear um, uh, Proliferation Treaty, a norm of disarmament, a legally binding norm of disarmament that binds all the state parties to the nuclear weapons treaties. And it's a legally binding obligation to disarm. The International Court of Justice in the nuclear weapons case in 1996 explained very clearly that this is not just an obligation of means, it's an obligation of results. It means it needs to lead to a concrete result. That is the obligation of states' parties to the, to the non-proliferation treaties that they have to work towards. So you see we have an entire normative architecture and an architecture of international law that I think must lead <laughs> to nuclear disarmament and to the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. And Carlos was explaining all the you know, humanitarian, all the consequences in real life that happen when a nuclear um, weapon is, is detonated. So how can that possibly be compatible with the international humanitarian law norms that states have agreed to? Now, what needs to be done, I think we sort of, we can zoom in on, you know, perhaps even just 2022 and all the things that must be done but also can be done. Uh, in 2022. We have this first meeting of states parties of the TPNW and first of all I think we have to commend the Austrian government to host uh, uh, um, a day dedicated to uh, focusing on the humanitarian consequences of, of nuclear weapons which sort of sets the scene uh, also of why we are here and what we are working towards. And then the first meeting of states parties as a milestone doesn't have to deal with all the issues of nuclear weapons and all the issues of verification, but many things can already happen on you know, setting up a competent authorities that is tasked with uh, implementing the treaty, um, already deciding on deadlines for, um, you know, uh, um, uh, um, um, elimination of nuclear weapons in host territories, for instance. What we also, I think, need to see is thinking about the relationship and the synergies between the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty and the TPNW and how they can complement each other, particularly in terms of victim assistance, in terms of uh, environmental uh, remediation. And then also to set up a good structure within the TPNW about scientific research data, etc. Because again, and this is what Carlos was describing, you know, this is also things that we find out more and more about the effects of nuclear weapons and that have to inform 
um, our discussions. And then, of course, later on in August, we have the review conference of the, of the non-proliferation treaty. And there again, I think we can have very concrete expectations towards, um, towards states to take concrete measures, and particularly in this time of really needed risk reduction. Carlos was talking about the nuclear weapons which are on high alert. One of the things that the ICRC would like to see is to have the nuclear weapons taken off high alert, mm -hmm. to have them have less importance in the military strategies, in the concrete military strategies of states. So there's a lot of work to be done very concretely. Um, we, we're looking forward to this. We're also looking forward to seeing some of the um, states that are not yet in the, in the position to join the TPNW to still come as observers to uh, Vienna for the, for, the, um, uh, for the first meeting of states parties, states like Norway, and we really uh, welcome that and we hope that that can also lead to you know, uh, um, good discussions and, and synergies to work towards this common goal that all these treaties have in common, which is ultimately an elimin elimination of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Um, you've all done a tremendous job in helping describe this very complex <laughs> landscape and architecture. Um, so drilling now, as, as you've already started to elaborate, into what can be done in the near and, sh um, near and medium term, um, what advice do you have for policymakers in terms of taking action now toward a nuclear weapon free world? Um, Beatrice, could we start with you? I think there's, I mean, I think we have to recognize that continuing to rely on nuclear weapons or like the, the current situation will change. Like things are changing right now and we really have op options ahead of us. Um, there will be many governments who look at the situation in Ukraine and draw the consequences that we need to have nuclear weapons or we need to form a nuclear umbrella with who, whichever nuclear armed state is the closest to us, um, which I think would be very dangerous uh, and can really escalate non like a proliferation sort of cycle, undermine the MPT uh, and all, all, all of that. Um, and the other option is, of course, that this is a problem. Uh, these nuclear threats are really, really problem. And by continuing to rely on nuclear deterrence, we are basically putting our entire security in hands of people like Putin and just say, we trust him. 100% we trust him that he won't do it. And watching how this conflict has progressed and, and that the conflict happened at all from the beginning, that, he, that they took the decision to invade Ukraine, makes it really uncertain. Can we trust him? I wouldn't. I don't think that's a very good idea. So I think that you know, there's two, you know, to, to me, like the only conclusion then, if we don't want to see a massive proliferation, we have to work towards disarmament. And that's, of course, a long process. Um, and I think that they, I would split like, what, what my recommendations would be right now into two parts. First, the very immediate urgency is to do everything we can to avoid nuclear weapons use right now in this conflict. And for me, that really involves we need to raise the threshold for use, and that means condemning strongly, in the strongest terms, the threats to use, declaring that that is unacceptable. Um, it is illegal under the treaty, but it's also unacceptable for anyone, even if they haven't joined the treaty. Just like we condemn Russia's use of cluster munitions and landmines, even though they haven't signed those treaties. Um, we have to really refrain, we, we can't let the use of nuclear weapons to be normalized. There's a big push, and we've seen it. I had a conversation a few weeks ago with actually Dmitry Muratov, uh, who really you know, warned that there is an in, a coordinated attempt in Russia, in Russian state media, to normalize the idea to Russian people that nuclear weapons use is inevitable, it's going to happen. And we just have to get used to it. So we really have to push back on that seriously. We need to talk about the humanitarian consequences. We need to share facts and research about what happens when nuclear weapons are used. The fact that we can't respond, we cannot let this narrative of, well, just a small tactical nuclear weapon. The smallest of Russian nuclear ta tactical nuclear weapons is, is Hiroshima-sized. That's a small tactical nuclear weapon. Um, so I think we, we really have to strengthen the work and we need governments to really speak out on the humanitarian consequences, really reject nuclear threats, condemn nuclear threats, 
Um, and I think we've seen some positive signals also from, you know, the fact that we've seen some of the Western nuclear arms that not threaten to use nuclear weapons, first of all, because it's not a credible threat, but also because, you know, it's, it's stigmatized. It's not acceptable behavior. And I think that's something we really need to encourage and push forward and say, yes, you really do need to condemn this. I saw that the G7 statement, for example, condemned irresponsible nuclear threats, which makes me wonder what is a responsible <laughs> nuclear threat. Uh, but I think that we need to push more, more of that, and we need to hear more of those things, and we need to really do everything. And I think every government has a responsibility now to raise the threshold for any use of nuclear weapons and really make it as unacceptable as possible. And the long term, of course, is, you know, we're going to have to solve this problem. And we have to make a plan. Uh, I mean, we have a plan. The ban is the plan for yes. us, uh, of course, uh, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. But even if, if uh, not all governments want, want to join that treaty right now, I still think it's extremely important that we articulate to our people what is the plan here. Just like with climate change, we cannot wait forever. We cannot just hope that the next government or the next generation will solve this. Uh, because we are really, if we do that, if we just keep waiting, we will see probably proliferation, more threats like this, maybe other nuclear armed states do this to other countries, feeling empowered to, you know, the, the ones with the most nuclear weapons can just decide which country to take from now on. Um, so we really have to uh, use this moment and use the lessons learned of these last month to work on uh, nuclear disarmament, really, to articulate that as a goal and to start making a concrete plan. Uh, and ideally through the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is the only legal instrument that exists that does that right now. Thank you. Carlos, your advice for policymakers? <laughs> well, we have to be aware that a nuclear war is not a natural catastrophe. It is something that we can and we must prevent. I'm going to echo uh, Mariana Borgens, the mayor of Oslo's words this morning. The time for nuclear abolition is now. So I wrote some ideas I'm going to read a little bit. <laughs> it is urgent to delegitimize nuclear weapons and to take effective measures towards disarmament. It is urgent that decision makers be consistent with democratic and humanitarian values. That public policy do what it's supposed to do. Put people first. The opposite of the existential threat of nuclear weapons is not more nuclear weapons and more threats. It's not another deterrent. It is peace. And peace is, not, is, peace is built with bridges and creating opportunities for cooperation, something that takes an arduous and continuous diplomatic work. The opposite of nuclear weapons is multilateralism, and the multilateralism that is materialized and embodied in the ban treaty, the TPNW. So, it is necessary for the policymakers who are in power right now to once and for all break this loop of complacency that has us under this existential threat. So, policymakers, the time is now and the responsibility is yours. Not for the next person in a suit, but yours. No more excuses. The world cannot live on excuses. Nuclear disarmament certainly is not an easy feat. It is difficult, and it's, it is urgent, but more importantly, it is possible. And it is your obligation to find the route to take us there. Our very survival depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Cordula, please. Well, it's difficult to say more than, than Beatrice and Carlos really, <laughs> and I can only echo what they say. I think, again, it's about bringing the reality back into the room, um, because it is often those who advocate against nuclear weapons and for the elimination of nuclear weapons who are um, you know, deemed to be unrealistic because the theory goes or the argument goes that it's not possible because at the moment we still need them and the world is too difficult, the, geo the geopolitical situation is too difficult, etc. And as Carlos said, it isn't easy and I don't, want, I don't mean to say that it is, but what it sort of pushes by the wayside that there is also 
a certain realism to be had about the fact that we cannot respond to a nuclear detonation. And what we cannot respond to, we must prevent, mm. as we have said and as was uh, mentioned at the beginning of, of, of this entire conference. What we cannot respond to and what we cannot, you know, uh, even imagine in terms of the suffering, we have to prevent, and that's important. And the, the voice of our little friend here in his pushchair brings me to my sec second, uh, perhaps, um, message, which is that we also um, have to, I think, invest into, on the one hand, science and facts, etc., but also on um, conveying this to youth, and also um, investing in uh, youth movements that are engaged in this. And there are very inspiring youth movements, such as in Japan, that work uh, on this issue of nuclear weapons and are trying to really uh, revive this and, um, and, and get to this el elimination of nuclear weapons. And, and that gives me hope um, that you have young people who, who take this on. This is not a sort of old 1960s Cold War issue. It's an issue that's very live. And the majority of youth who are asked in polls about their feelings about nuclear weapons are absolutely against nuclear weapons. And I think that we have to take our cue from that as well and, um, and continue doing this work because there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. It is a great challenge to end a panel on this topic um, on a hopeful note. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> Um, time, unfortunately, does not allow for Q&A during the session, um, but you are welcome to, to save your questions for the panelists during the reception that will follow at 7 o'clock. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being here and sharing your expertise. Um, please kindly join me in thanking um, our experts. <laughs> Thank you so much to the panel. It's not every day we have representatives from three Nobel Peace Prize winning organizations on stage, so thank you so much. Uh, while we rearrange the stage slightly, uh, this should be fine. Uh, we are looking forward to have Norway's perspective on disarmament. And uh, to, to, uh, to listen to that, we have Mr. Eivind Wald Pettersson from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was appointed State Secretary in October 2021. Prior to his appointment, Val Petersson was the Foreign and Defense Policy Advisor to the Labour Party Parliamentary Group, working closely with MP Anniken Wittfeldt in her role as Chair of the Storting's Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defense. Between 2010 and 2016, he was posted as a diplomat to Norway's embassies to South Sudan, South Africa and Germany. Please take the stage. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, <clears throat> let me start uh, by, by thanking, of course, the Nobel Peace uh, Center and in particular Executive Director Kjersti Flugsta for the invitation to speak. Uh, it is indeed an honor to, to be here and speak in the company of several uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Um, tonight we are also celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT. And as a legally binding instrument to end nuclear testing, the CTBT is a vital component in the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation architecture. And I'll come back to the CTBT and the importance role of NORSAR uh, a bit later. The focus on the contemporary nuclear threat is disturbingly relevant. Russia's unprovoked and ruthless military attack on Ukraine has made disarmament efforts even more arduous and it has fundamentally altered the European security landscape. Russia's rhetoric on nuclear weapons is reckless and dangerous. And it's worth recalling that just a few weeks before its attack, Russia signed a joint statement of the P5 countries affirming that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. In the past several years, great power rivalry has led to erosion of the multilateral disarmament architecture. New weapon systems are being developed and deployed, 
and regional actors, such as North Korea, are threatening international peace and security. Faced with increased threats to allied security, NATO solidarity is vital, and Norway is fully committed to NATO's deterrence and defense strategy. The current challenges to nuclear disarmament are numerous. We must nevertheless persist in preparing the groundwork for future binding arms control and disarmament agreements. Disarmament must be mutual, balanced, ver verifiable and re irreversible. We therefore, as a Norwegian government, continue our engagement for nuclear disarmament verification. Where Norway is the driving force for progress both at the UN and on technical work. We have also initiated a new effort on irreversibility in disarmament, for which we hope to engage both nuclear weapon and non-nuclear weapon states. This would include discussions on concrete measures uh, nuclear weapon states uh, could take for ensuring that future disarmament will not be reversed. Our work on verification and irreversibility are among the concrete contributions to the upcoming review conference of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, uh, scheduled for, for New York in, in early August. Norway is also part of the Stockholm Initiative, working to advance nuclear disarmament and measures for nuclear risk reduction. The overarching goal, uh, of course, is the full implementation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the NPT forms the foundation uh, for all our nuclear disarmament efforts. Additionally, the Norwegian government that took office in October last year uh, is increasing our focus on the humanitarian consequences on, uh, of nuclear weapons, an important dimension for progress on nuclear disarmament efforts by moving the focus from the strategic domain to the catastrophic consequences that any use of nuclear weapons would entail for people and the environment. Our approach is based on the consensus final document of the 2010 NPT Review Conference. Uh, and as was the case at the Oslo 2013 conference, the purpose is to establish a fact-based understanding of the effects of a nuclear detonation. As many of you present here tonight will remember, the Oslo conference concluded uh, that it may not be possible to provide sufficient capacity for rescue efforts after a nuclear detonation that our historical experience from use and testing has demonstrated that the devastating immediate and long-term effects and that the effects will not be constrained by national borders. We are working closely with relevant Norwegian agencies to study various potential consequences of a nuclear detonation. These include, of course, both immediate and long-term effects on human health, critical infrastructure, environment, soil and air. Heat blast and radiation will cause the initial devastating destruction. The extent will depend on the size of the warhead and the altitude of which the explosion occurs. Conditions on the ground, such as population density, buildings and vegetation are also factors. These are the most immediate consequences. However, it is also necessary to take a more in-depth look on the mid and long-term consequences on human health, the environment and ecosystems as well as the socio-economic disruption in our interconnected world. And as the topic of this conference so aptly illustrates, we need to update our insight uh, into these consequences, considering the current threat landscape. One possible path forward, uh, in my view, is to increase our focus on the humanitarian consequences of the nuclear testing that has already taken pl place. Uh, and in less than two weeks, <coughs> On June the 20th, uh, Norway will participate uh, at the Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons. As announced, Norway will also be an observer to the first meeting of the state parties to the Nuclear Ban Treaty. Our purpose is to counteract uh, an increasingly polarized global debate on nuclear disarmament and to be present where disarmament is discussed at the UN. I will be honest and straightforward with you and uh, underline that being an observer does not represent a step towards signing the treaty, which we continue to believe is incompatible with our NATO commitments. But we acknowledge and understand the impatience of the so far 86 countries of the world that have signed the treaty. Our goal remains to rid the world of nuclear weapons. An important step in this direction would be the entry into force of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty which Norway strongly advocates. Once in effect, the CTBT will restrict non-nuclear states' potential paths to develop nuclear weapons technology. 
We also urge the early negotiation and conclusion of a verifiable fissile material cutoff treaty, which will prohibit the production of the material needed to develop nuclear weapons. Norway has fulfilled our responsibilities under the verification regime of the CTBT. There are six monitoring stations on Norwegian territory operated by Norsar uh, on our behalf. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the team at Norsar uh, for their professional operation and the assistance they provide to the CTBT. Let me conclude my remarks by reiterating uh, my uh, gra grave concern over the reckless rhetoric on the use of nuclear weapons. We can and must not allow the threshold for nuclear use to be lowered. It is incorrect to assume that the use of lower yield nuclear weapons will have limited or merely regional consequences. Any use would have catastrophic humanitarian and environmental consequences, and it would entirely change the nature of a conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our final speaker of today is Jørgen Vatne Fridnes. He is the director of the island of Utøya. He has an MA in International Relations from the University of York in the UK, 12 years experience from Doctors Without Borders, and is currently a board member of the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. Fridnes is also a member of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. Please come up on stage. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm here to summarize a bit what have we been doing today. Um, as uh, Kim stated, I normally work on the island of Utøya. Uh, for those of you who know, that is a place where 69 people, mainly young people, were shot and killed due to their political beliefs. So Utøya is a place for the most serious conversations and feelings. But it's also a place for hope and resilience, a place where young people come together to change the world. And to me, being here with you is something similar. Uh, a day of seriousness, of fear, um, but also a really awarding day with inspiring people and with hope. Um, as Sharsti talked about, anti-nuclear campaigners have been an important part for many decades for the Norwegian uh, Nobel Committee. Several peace prizes have been awarded, in whole or in part, for this type of peace work. But even though we have focused on, and many activists around the world have worked for the abolishment of nuclear weapons, they unfortunately still exist. Russia's invasion of Ukraine makes this uh, topic uh, relevant, as we've been talking about all day. Several nations still threaten to destroy entire cities, to destroy life, to make our beautiful world uninhabitable for future generations. While some may trust, or at least trusted, that no responsible head of state would ever order another nuclear attack, there's no guarantees that that will not happen. And that the notion of a limited nuclear war is an illusion. It was said several times that we cannot normalize a situation where limited nuclear war is possible and acceptable. And this normalization, as the reports from Dimitri in uh, Russia tells us happening is there, is unacceptable. The humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons has been uh, the past um, uh, hour. This is not a theoretical exercise. It's real. Humanita humanity will suffer. Um, this conference has been an important step to give us better knowledge to the many challenges ahead. The deterrent approach that militates against any state's first use of nuclear weapons, it doesn't get rid of a wall of nuclear weapons, but its supporters argue that it's the most effective way. Then there are those exponents of the global zero approach. A third approach, applying economic, military, and other sanction has its supporters. Someone highlighted that do we have enough and much needed conversations about the disarmament between officials and experts from non-nuclear weapon states and from those of the nuclear weapon states themselves? Do they both seriously 
discuss the substantive conditions necessary to achieve verifiable and enforceable elimination of nuclear arsenals. A quote, when we stop talking, that is bad news. We need safe spaces to discuss. Have nuclear weapon states, in spite of their disarmament rhetoric, really engage with the challenge themselves? Or have they only tended to view disarmament as something that the nuclear weapon states should undertake and report back to when it's accomplished? Ultimately, the real question is, will any of these approach approaches actually work? We don't know for sure, but that is not, not the reason not to try. It was said that nuclear weapons cannot be disinvented, but I guess no human creation can be disinvented. Civilizations, nevertheless, can prohibit and have prohibited and dismantled artifacts deemed too dangerous, demand damaging or morally objectionable to continue living with. And nuclear weapons are not solely a question to be addressed by governments, nor a matter for experts or high-level politicians. Nuclear weapons concern everyone. We're all on the front line, it was said. Without attention, no leverage. Without leverage, no change. It was also said that we're sleepwalking towards a catastrophe. So how to get people's attentions? Movies, the brilliant example of today. Thought experiments, witness testimonies. We all have a role to play. Several have recognized that the nuclear armed states cannot eliminate their nuclear weapons overnight. This must be achieved through a mutual, gradual and verifiable disarmament process. Um, in the beginning, it was said that it took 25 years to get an agreement, so we need stamina. But we must remain, but it must remain our target. And for that, we need hope. Because learning to live with these weapons in blind acceptance has been and will be a great mistake. And for this, all of you are key. And I think being here, it's always appropriate to quote Mandela. Again, as someone else did. It always seems impossible until it's done. So I think on behalf of the Nobel Committee, but basically on behalf of everyone living on this earth, thank you so much for the work you're doing. And thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jürgen, for those um, uh, closing remarks. I was going to give you this uh, tote bag uh, as our appreciation, and uh, I have one for all the speakers that have been on stage. Thank you so much. But now I just want to thank all our partners. So Anna, Tuva and Susanna, may you please come up so that people can see our good partners that have made this a reality. And uh, I'm so thankful and so pleased for, for this day and for the whole campaign that we've been doing together. So, Susanna, thank you so much. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. So, this is Susanna from, for, from Games for Change. Anna Likke from Nursa, we met you. And then Tuva Vichel from Thanks ICANN. So thank you so much. <laughs> and um, uh, before we leave, the, we leave the stage, I will give the floor to you, Anna, to... Um, to tell what's happening now, but just before that, I will just say thank you to everyone for coming. For those of you traveling very far, thank you for coming here today. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience and it's uh, streamed, so it will be possible for, uh, to share it with the whole world, <laughs> as you may uh, want after this experience. I, for myself, will do that anyway. So thank you so much. Well, please Anna. stay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kjersti, for being part of this uh, fantastic partnership and this uh, very interesting day. Uh, it's been great for us to be able to place the CTBT in this wider context. And although we all are very impatient to solve the nuclear issues and challenges, it is a good reminder, actually, that it took our team 25 years to get to the CTBT. And unfortunately, it still has some work left before it formally enters into force. 
but we will get there, I'm sure. And thank you to the State Secretary for your kind words to the NUSHA team, and uh, to Ben for showing us uh, all the technology's possibilities and explaining it in such a vivid way. And then it's my pleasure to say uh, nothing more, really, uh, because we've had a long day and a lot of food for thought, and now we will get some food and drink uh, and mingle and discuss what we've learned today. Uh, so thank you for opening the museum also to the celebration of the CTBT 25 years. Thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>